snowy Davos, we are going to dive into the high seas and the deep ocean. Welcome. My name is Monica Medina, and I'm the president and CEO of the Wildlife Conservation Society. We are a field-based conservation organization that works all over the world on conservation in ocean areas and on land. And we also run an aquarium in New York, so we are very engaged in ocean education. This is an ocean century. One of the keys to harnessing the benefits of the ocean, as well as protecting it, is good governance. That's something we've heard over and over again this week at Davos, the importance of governance. And until recently, the ocean outside of the areas within national jurisdictions, national territory, which goes out 200 miles from the ocean, from the, from the shore, those areas outside that, we call that the high seas for shorthand, um, have not had as much governance until recently. Uh, there are two areas in which there was governance, in fisheries and in shipping. But there was no way to create protected areas in the ocean. There were no legal mechanisms to do that, and no way to ensure that the benefits of marine biodiversity found in those areas beyond the national jurisdictions the areas beyond biodiversity, beyond national jurisdictions, or BBNJ, there was no way to protect and conserve and share the benefits with all of the people of the Earth. So recently, the UN, after a number of years, concluded an agreement called the BBNJ, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction Agreement. And it was a huge accomplishment. It took 10 years to negotiate and finalize. After a marathon session in March at the UN, negotiators from all around the world unanimously agreed to this agreement. And within six months, 84 countries had signed it. And as of yesterday, the first country has ratified it because it's a treaty. So congratulations to Chile for getting the first into the agreement, first ratifier of this new High Seas Treaty. So we have a wonderful panel here today to talk about the importance of this treaty and to talk about its potential for tapping into both this new area of marine biodiversity and, and the uses that it could have and the ways that it could make our lives better and to talk about the ways that we could start to create protected areas in the high seas that will actually create even more economic benefits. Because if you don't manage something, you can't benefit from it. And that's sort of the history and the, the importance of the Law of the Sea Convention on which, in which this treaty will sit. So we have a wonderful panel of experts here to talk about it from different perspectives, which is fantastic. And I'm going to introduce each of them and ask them a question. Uh, first, we have the Foreign Minister of Costa Rica, His Excellency Arnaldo Andre. We have Sanda Ojaimbayo, uh, who is the Assistant Secretary General and the CEO of the UN Global Compact. We have Nicholas Martinson, who is the CEO of Stena Line AB, a large shipping company. And we have Andrew Steer, the president and CEO of the Bezos Earth Fund, who's here to talk about philanthropy's role. So with that, we'll get started. Foreign Minister Andre, Costa Rica has been a leader in marine conservation for many, many years, decades. And recently, your country and three others joined to with together to create one of the largest marine protected areas straddling their EEZs, their jurisdictional waters. But it also abuts the high seas. So it was sort of a, a precursor for, and it showed the way for this agreement. And now protected areas on the high seas could complement the ones that are being created in uh, inside ocean territories of particular countries. So we know. We know that your government, along with Chile and several others in the region, are very interested in seeing this treaty ratified. Why is this so important for cooperation? As a foreign minister, obviously, you're looking for ways to cooperate and to partner and to build bridges between governments and countries. But also, how is it important for your government and your country's economy? Thank you. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm very honored 
to speak to you on behalf of Costa Rica. Indeed, uh, it was a 20 years of negotiations for, for the UN member states to achieve. And the official name is Treaty, Treaty for the Conservation and Sustainable Use of Marine Biological Diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Yes. Quite a mouthful. <laughs> BBNJ. BBNJ. Uh, where, where Costa Rica participated in the whole process and, and led some of the Latin American initiatives in the first drafts together with Monaco. And we have made out of the blue, what we call the blue diplomacy or the ocean diplomacy, a, a, one of the main foreign policy objectives of our administration and are working hard on it. I can point out uh, four, four areas uh, derived from the treaty where in interaction between public and private sector can operate regarding marine genetic resources, which is one of the four main elements of the BBNJ Treaty. There's benefits arising from activities involving marine genetic resources and their associated digital sequence information that must now be shared fairly and equitably among states. It is a big opportunity, for instance, for Costa Rican companies to be ready to make the most of these shared benefits given their potential use in biochemicals use in, for example, medicine, cosmetics, and food supplements. Another, and the second element of the treaty, is the area-based management tools, including marine protected areas. You were mentioning our initiative called CMAR, which is an agreement between Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, and Ecuador, we are all borderline countries by the sea. Um, Ecuador extends its line to the Galapagos Island, uh, Colombia to its Malpelo Island, Panama to the Coiba Island, and Costa Rica to the Cocos Island, thereby creating a 500,000 square kilometer special protected zone for the Pacific. It's the first, the first. international launched and, and, and it's on the way of being implemented in some years, but we're doing good progress in managing that part of the Pacific together with governance among the four countries. Uh, <coughs> states can establish these uh, areas to manage human activities in this specific, specifically delimited for conservation and or sustainable use purposes. Under the new framework, statements can implement larger scale, legally binding and multi-sectoral area-based management <coughs> tools, which can benefit sectors of their population. The agreement requires states to collaborate and consult with relevant stakeholders including scientific community, indigenous peoples, and local communities, and the private sector when formulating plans for area-based management tools. A third element where it will be very relevant for governments to establish clear and robust domestic legislation is the one related to environmental impact assessments, EIA. The state with jurisdiction or control over the activities in international areas must ensure the identification of key environmental, economic, social, cultural, and human health impacts and identify measures to prevent, mitigate, and manage potentially adverse effects of the planned activities. The EIA must include a public notification and consultation process and there is a continuous obligation on states to monitor and periodically report on the environmental and associated effects of an authorized activity. The fourth 
area or element I want to mention is very relevant to <coughs> developing countries. It's the capacity building and transfer of marine technology. The agreement provides that states shall cooperate to assist each other, in particular developing states, in achieving the BBNJ agreement objectives through capacity building and the transfer, transfer of marine technology, including through partnerships with the private sector. This offers a big opportunity for Costa Rican private companies to benefit from training courses and the transfer of technology through a fund that was established for this objective. So, as you can see, there are rights and obligations arising from the treaty that governments must address, creating the conditions for the private sector to fully benefit and comply with them. Although this new agreement is fundamental, a fundamental tool to improve ocean governance and an important tool to ensure the global of protect the goal of protecting 30% of the ocean by 2030, as agreed in the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, it is not the only area in which we must continue to work. For this reason, we are urging all countries to actively participate in the negotiations taking place in the International Seabed Authority in Kingston, Jamaica. Costa Rica will continue to promote the call for a precautionary pause so that mining does not begin on the sea floor in international areas until the necessary legal framework is in place and until we have enough scientific information to guarantee the effective protection of the marine environment as required by Article 145 of the U U United Convention on the Law of the Sea. I'm very proud to say that my country is profoundly engaged with the International Blue Agenda, and as such, we feel very honored to co-host, together with France, the third UN Ocean Conference to accelerate action and implementation of ocean action. On our way to this important event for the international community and the planet, Costa Rica will organize in June of this year the high-level event on ocean action titled Immersed in Change, which will showcase best practices and successful experiences to improve the health of the ocean. I hope I get to welcome you all in Costa Rica in June the 7th and 8th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foreign Minister. What an excellent summary of this very complex agreement. There are indeed four important parts, and that was a wonderful, uh, a wonderful summary of those. And I also would uh, second the notion that these conferences, yours this year and then the UN Ocean Conference in France next year, will be tremendous opportunity to again talk about the importance of this treaty. So now I'd like to turn to you, Sanda, and ask you about how the Global Compact is and your organization are, are working to try to implement this agreement even before it goes into effect. How can you work now sort of in these pre-stages, pre-competitive uh, cooperation? How can you foster that to ensure its success? And how, um, uh, and what are the partners, what are the type of partners that you're looking to, to work with you on this? Yeah. Great, thanks. And I, I'm really happy to talk about this from the private sector perspective. The Global Compact works with businesses around the world to, to really create a movement of, of businesses that really are sustainable, that care about the sustainable development goals and how we manage and use our resources for the benefit of, of business and, and for the world. So let me start first with just addressing a governance issue and I'll put my call to action out right away. And, and it's, it's really great to be here in, in Davos and have the overarching theme of rebuilding trust and, and underpinning that is obviously governance and norms. So it's great to be 
able to talk about the treaty and you know the call to action here is to have speedy ratification so that we can really have a framework that governs obviously how how the ocean works so some of our work that we're doing with businesses where we can sit with governments and talk about collaboration, governance, and norms. It's really core for the continued work on the ratification. And I just want to applaud those in the room who've been working at this for 10, 20 years, because it's incredible work, Peter. But I know that we share the sentiment that we don't have another 10 years to, to wait for ratification and, and, and action. So fully in support of, of quick and, and speedy action on that. And having said that, applaud Chile, applaud Costa Rica for the work that they're doing and the frameworks that allow you know, good governance of the ocean resources. Um, I mean, statistics say, I think it's sort of 97% of the ocean is, is out there, unknown, um, unexplored. But we have an opportunity to really steward how the rest of this ocean ecosystem is used. Um, so from the, the private sector perspective, I mean, the UN Global Compact has brought together what we call an oceans coalition, which is a really strong group of companies that, that come to the ocean uh, agenda looking at a couple of things. Obviously, there's shipping, which is a big uh, business piece, and really grateful to see big movement on issues such as decarbonization with the IMO, really working to make sure that we can get into green shipping. There's obviously sustainable aquaculture, which is very important, how we use that precious resource. Opportunity to use technology around mapping and understanding what really lies within the ocean and the ocean ecosystem. A lot of work around plastics and eliminating plastic pollution, very critical. And um, also just looking at energy and renewable energy generation. So the ocean really does provide a lot of great investment opportunities, but also opportunities, if not governed well, really can represent very fast depletion of a precious resource. Um, statistics say there's a $3 trillion opportunity uh, of solid, sustainable business investments in the ocean. And we're very keen to bring businesses together to look at it in that way, um, a very solid uh, business opportunity. So what do we do? We, through our Oceans Coalition, first we sit and work with governments, and we have some great government support. Uh, the Oceans Conferences provide great frameworks for those kinds of convenings, but certainly working bilaterally to make sure that we can push for ratification for good norms around uh, what needs to happen on that. Secondly, is also just creating you know, governance and good behavior, sustainable business behavior within the industries themselves. So as I talked about, great movement on decarbonization with the IMO and others last year, but a lot more that we can do around the, the tipping points that I talked about. And then the third is to look at frameworks for financial investments to go into the oceans. If we look at it from a sustainable development goals perspective, goal 14 continues to be one of the least invested in sustainable development goals. And I know there's a lot of effort and advocacy that goes towards that. But we really have to, you know, the, the goals are a great framework for global development, but they all need equal investment. So, um, you know, I put out there that it's a huge business opportunity, but it's also a great investment opportunity in oceans itself, in the climate debate, and overall, you know, sustainable uh, development framework. Framework. So together with our coalition, and this brings together, as I said, it's shippers, it's some um, insurers, it's um, you know people working in the fishing industry, it's tech, it's it's um, a whole lot of uh, large business coalitions, insurance risk management as well, uh, renewable energies, transport and trade, really working together collectively to see how we can support what happens in this next phase of ocean exploration. It's a great business <coughs> opportunity, but it must be done right. It's a wonderful, wonderful segue to our next panelist. But let me put a, a, a point on that, uh, that stat that you raised about only 3% of investment in sustainable development goals is going to this one, 14 on oceans. And that needs to change. And I hope that these sorts of efforts, that having this kind of governance will make investment a more attractive proposition and this is the decade of ocean science, and I think we've talked a lot in, during the week about the fact that we know more about the surface of Mars than we know about the ocean. Another stunning statistic for people who um, you know, think about space. We need to think about the ocean as a real opportunity for us here on Earth, and it's so vital to, to everything that we do. We, we depend on it for oxygen, for livelihoods, um, and so that is a good segue, thinking about businesses and responsibilities towards this massive area. You know, people think it's so huge it can't be harmed, but it's actually quite fragile. And big shipping companies like yours uh, 
do know, Nicholas, that the ocean is a precious resource, and you see it that way. You've been involved in ocean health and trying to protect oceans as a shipping company, and 90% of global trade actually moves by ship across the ocean. So it connects us in many, many ways, and its health is really vital. So I'd be interested in hearing about what high seas shipping companies like yours see out there in the ocean, things like the plastic gyres, you know, the kinds of, of harm that is happening out there, why this treaty is so important, and how businesses can help to, to, uh, to make sure that the ocean is protected and that the treaty goes into effect and can help you. You already work under the, Air, the International Maritime Organization rules, but those only rely or, or only are, are covering shipping. They don't cover fisheries or all these other activities. So help us to understand how fragile the oceans are and, and how companies like yours and the new entrance into this, into this space can protect the ocean. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me here today as well. It's a, it's a great honor. Um, representing a pure family-owned company, no listed, not, no external financing support or anything like that, we have a very long-term perspective of life. Uh, and, and we're looking into generation three, four, five to understand that we have decided to, to continue being in the business for maybe 300 more years. And therefore, you need to have a long-term perspective of what we're doing. And as, as you said, 90% of all the cargo in the world is transported by, by ship. So therefore, I see that we have a huge responsibility, being a shipping company, to actually using part of the nature. And, and that can't be for free. And in that case, what we have done so far is looking into not the big bang that is coming 2050, when everybody is talking about the net zero or, or even minus zero, because it's too easy to lean back on a strategy and say that we fix it 2048, 2049, and then we're done for the 2050. We're in 2024 now, and I think what we need to focus on in a very regulated business as shipping, shipping is, um, we have the initiative from IMO, we have it from Brussels from a European perspective, where we are constrained with a lot of regulations where the focus is the 2050. For us, it's very much about the big little things. What can we do during this process and see how we can have a positive trend up to 2050 instead? I think um, what we have done, for example, as a private owned company is we were the first uh, shipping company in the world to transform a existing ship into methanol. And now because of that, we also have taken big stakes in the first production of green methanol made in Scandinavia. We're talking about a price tag of roughly 300% more cost in bunker, which our customers are not willing to pay. The majority of our customers maybe have a, a, a gross profit margin of one and a half to two percent. So talking about business opportunity from a shipping perspective, then you need to have a long-term perspective and understand that you're putting yourself in the good guy's box. But we do not see that the business will increase for us just because we're doing the investments as such. The problem is, which I see as, as the regulations coming up from IMO, for example, is that it's actually not the first mover advantage. It could be the last mover advantage, just waiting, waiting, waiting. And I think that is a very big threat for the planet and the water as such. I talked about the methanol, which we had converted, and we have now two more ships to be converted the next two years. Um, we are looking into the big little things here. It could be propeller blades, <coughs> that is reducing the sound effects underwater, for example. Um, it could be new, uh, new ways of painting the hull to reduce the chemicals, for example. Um, and also um, a new way of technologies in how we're via AI, for example. Now you're doing huge investments to improve the efficiency, how we're sailing, to reduce the, the, the way we are using the hull in the water, once again, for the underwater uh, uh, sound 
but also uh, how we are treating uh, the other animals in the water as well. So I think um, in that perspective, the big little things are important to have a positive trend and not only waiting for 2049 uh, in that case. Also saying that that means that with too many regulations, it's also constrained the innovations. And I think parts of how we are finding financial solutions in the shipping industry is for R&D and innovations. I think the day when we can get financial support from governments when we go into operation, that's where it makes a difference because there is so many great innovations that it stopped <coughs> on the writing table because nobody can afford to put it into operation. And I think both from the water perspective, but the earth as such, I think bringing more incentives to get the innovations into operation will you make it big, big, big thing for not only the shipping industry, but for Mother Earth her, herself. Wonderful. We do need more companies in that good guy box. Mm. And the more companies that get in that good guy box, the easier it is to, for regulation to follow, because then it's the standard. And True. Uh, but I think to, to contribute to a healthy sea from a shipping perspective, we need support ashore. For example, green electrified grids, so we can go electrified when we're right. sailing on green the seas. Ports. Exactly. So it's not only about what's happening in the water, but that's where the consequences are. You bring a big, a, a really important point um, up, which is the, the technology has changed. I think one of the things that made this agreement so hard to come to fruition was the fact that the ocean was, is so big. And until recent technological advances, we couldn't really imagine uh, how we could govern it well. And now, with the technologies that we have, we think, um, it's very possible to have a much better sense of what we're actually doing, how we're impacting the ocean. So those environmental impact statements that will be required now, really important. So we'll understand better how we're hurting or potentially helping the ocean with technology and with better understanding. So Andrew, that's a, a good segue to you. You've spent a lot of time thinking about ocean conservation recently. You made a big announcement at, uh, at the COP in Dubai uh, to help big ocean countries out in the Pacific, the Pacific Island nations have much larger ocean territories as does a, com a country like Costa Rica. Their ocean space is much bigger than their land. And so thinking about this treaty from their perspective and from yours in philanthropy, how are you thinking about, or how, how can you help uh, speed ratification and implementation of this agreement? Do it well. Thanks, uh, Monica. And uh, we need to recognize this is a remarkable treaty, the High Seas Treaty. And uh, there are people in this room that actually worked extremely hard, some over 10 years, to make this happen. Peter Thompson is here, the special envoy for the ocean, and he's going to say some words at the end. Thank you, Peter. Um, this was not easy. Monica, you were too modest. You didn't announce your own role. Uh, Monica, our chairperson, was uh, Assistant Secretary of uh, the United States um, uh, Department of State, uh, responsible for the ocean. And you yourself pushed and pushed. And there are other people here over 10 years. This is an incredibly complicated process. A lot of law, a lot of science, and above all, a lot of politics involved. Um, and we are where we are, um, which is really wonderful. Um, but uh, the job's not done. <laughs> there is a massive job. We're just beginning, really. We've fired the starting gun. And so philanthropy can play, I think, a modestly helpful role. We're financing at the moment uh, the High Seas Alliance, which is a, a group of uh, over 50 uh, countries that are truly committed to move forward in a big way. And uh, why is that necessary? Well, it's necessary in the first instance to get, uh, get ratification. It's one thing for a, a president or a government to sign but it's quite different to get ratification. In most cases, that requires parliaments. That requires an awful lot of discussion and paperwork and, and information <laughs> and explaining and education um, and law. And so uh, that process is going on. It's wonderful that uh, Chile is uh, the first one that's now ratified. We need 60 countries to ratify by the end of 2025 in order for it to come into effect by the end of 2025. So that in and of itself is, is a big job and they're moving forward, obviously. There's still a huge amount 
of science that we need to invest in. We can be helpful there. Uh, a, a lot of um, coordination and law, a lot of issues, as uh, the, the minister was explaining, relating to you know, how a protected area in the high seas is actually created, which, is, which requires um, quite a complicated process. Um, and so philanthropy, I think, can play quite a, a good role because we can put money in very quickly um, and boldly and, uh, and sort of move things along. And we are not political in any sense, so we can be helpful. And one way we try to do that is working with groups of countries. Um, uh, Minister Andre, I mean, I commend you for what you did, uh, what you are doing in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. Back in COP26, you know, four heads of state of, of, of Colombia, Ecuador, Costa Rica, and Panama, they said, we want the biggest transnational network of protected areas and marine areas in, in the world. And since then, I mean, this is the beautiful thing about it. Since then, three of those four countries had changes of government mm -hmm. and quite different parties, and yet you are equally committed. I mean, it's, it's inspiring, actually, what you're doing. And, and that is within your own territorial borders. But, of course, as a group of countries and as leaders, as you were saying, Minister, you're able to play a role, actually, in the high seas as well. You have a credibility, uh, which is remarkable. For us, it was a privilege to to provide 40 million in grants, $40 million in grants, to support um, the eastern tropical Pacific uh, seascape. And a beautiful thing that then happened was um, the, the western and central Pacific islands, partly because they looked at you guys and, and you were able to do things actually pretty quickly and it looked like you were handling it extremely well. And so in Dubai, in just a month and a half ago, um, 16, um, originally 15, 16 now, Pacific Island leaders um, announced um, uh, a network of marine protected areas, which will be by far the biggest, um, four times the size of the United States. And, uh, and, and what's beautiful about it is that you could say, why do you all need to do it? I mean, why don't you do it one by one? Well, that would be all right. A couple of reasons. One, actually, marine life is... <laughs> Doesn't respect, doesn't respect international <laughs> borders. Um, and there's some pretty interesting and scary things happening in that part of the world. But a second thing which is really important is that actually, if you want real change, having soulmates that are in it with you is really valuable um, because it's not easy. And, and, and what you're doing on the Eastern Tropical Pacific Sea is fascinating to hear you know, your fishing ministers Dealing with fishermen, don't naturally assume that if you have protected areas, it's going to help them. Turns out that science now shows that actually if you protect the right 30%, you will actually increase your fishing catch. And seeing different fishing ministries and economy ministers talking to each other across national borders is really exciting. And that's now happening uh, in, the, in the Pacific. And we've put $100 million of grants on the table saying, look, we are willing to disperse this very quickly if there is a plan for these 16 countries and if other financiers uh, come in. So I think that's a, that's a helpful role that we can play. So we're in this for the long term because, um, as I think all the three uh, previous panel members have said, the stakes are extremely high. Um, the situation is highly complex. It requires leadership at every level, and we simply want to support what you guys are doing. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for your commitments um, to both the Eastern Tropical Pacific uh, Marine Protected Area and now the one in the uh, Western Central Pacific. It's, it's an amazing thing to see countries come together to decide to protect vast areas, and uh, they do help the economies of these places because they are places where the environment can regenerate itself. That's the wonderful thing about nature is it is regenerative and it does come back if you give it places where it's left alone. And that's the theory around these marine protected areas, that they actually improve the benefits that we receive from the ocean and they help us with climate change. They help the ocean to be much more resilient if we have these places that are not impacted by some of the other stressors. Um, and fishing is a, a, a huge problem in the ocean right now. And uh, I know that even as we think about um, 
protected areas in the high seas, that will help coastal fisheries because they're impacted by the way that high seas fishing is taking so much out of the ecosystem in general. So this treaty will be a huge help, I think, to boosting coastal economies, to boosting island nations that are, I think, struggling with climate change. Um, and that's why they have been such big supporters. Mr. Foreign Minister, I'd love to know your sense of um, having talked to other governments. How likely do you think uh, we can get this all the way into force? As Andrew said, it takes 60 countries. You've talked to many of the countries in your region you led. You helped lead the, the group from your region. Do you think we can get this entered into a force within a year, by the next Davos, perhaps? It, we signed we signed it, which was easy. I signed First. it as a second signature. Yes. On the well, there was a race to the there was a race at Unga to the table to <laughs> sign this agreement. It was great. That was quite easy. And then of course each country needs to go through its national ratification process, which you never know how politicians use it to get other things, especially the opposition parties. Uh, but this is a nature-oriented treaty that should not have much internal political opposition by, by the parties. And it's a good thing. It's a, a neutral thing for parties, so that I expect it, it won't have that much problem. It's on ourselves, the ones that believe in it, to remind our colleagues to put pressure on it, to educate, to train, to explain the need that, that will push it forward. In our region, we're doing our part, in, and we're convincing the other neighboring states and, and within the Americas pushing ratification for it and hope to get this year at least 10 to 20, yeah? That would be great. And hopefully, uh, if we get Latin American countries to come together and the Pacific Islands and the Europeans, that will get us pretty close to 60. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hope that next year at this session or one like it, we can talk about how it's being implemented because it's already gone into force. I want to ask one more question because another key part of this agreement was the benefit sharing and the access to marine genetic resources, the, the technology transfers. Uh, Sanda, can you talk about how important that is for business and for businesses in countries where they wouldn't have had access to this kind of, of technology or genetic information from which they could develop anything, the cure to the next, you know, another cure of cancer or something like that? No, absolutely. As, as I said in the beginning, it's, it's really untapped space, and, and that's why this governance framework, I think, is, is, is really important. Um, the group of businesses that we work with are really keen to advance a sustainable and equitable approach to how we use and manage uh, ocean resources, um, you know, at the cusp of so much that could exist around new technology and new opportunities. So it's totally an unexplored area. I think it's, it's just really important to have this governance framework around how everything is going to work. As I said, our coalition brings together such a wide range of, of companies, but certainly from the technological front, the, the mapping, the understanding of the resources and the opportunities, that really is, I think, the next and the biggest frontier. So, you know, anything from the, the support that governments give around creating the framework to the philanthropic uh, leveraging the that, you know, Andrew and many others work towards in terms of that financing is, is really what we need to, to go forward. I think it's, it's in such an important part of how working together, how collaboration and how um, making this kind of basic information, the, the starter, you know, the seed information available to entrepreneurs and scientists all over the world could unlock who knows what? I think the potential is tremendous, and that's what gives me goosebumps when I think about the potential of this, of this agreement and its ability to bring the world together to both find new solutions for other problems and to help save the ocean. So I think this has been an incredible panel, and I, I just want to say, you know, emphasize a few points in closing, the importance of philanthropy to sort of get the 
beginnings of the of the treaty working even before uh, it, it goes into effect and, and your work with countries who want to protect their ocean space and want to go beyond that into the high seas to be able to ensure that the protections in their jurisdictional waters are effective uh, is a wonderful thing, Andrew. And the work that companies are already doing to, to be co conservation-minded in the ocean and nature positive is really important because it helps keep a very fragile ocean protected. Um, the work with uh, businesses to try and help spur that, you know, bring on that new economy, that blue economy is so important, Sanda. And of course, you know, helping to get it over the finish line to be ratified and into effect is, is so important, Mr. Foreign Minister. And I, again, I hope we can, we can celebrate that next year when we're here again. So now I have the great honor of inviting uh, Sir Peter Thompson to the to the podium or to, up to the stage to give us some closing <coughs> remarks. Um, he is the UN Special Envoy on Oceans and an ocean champion. Did, when, uh, uh, I, did you bring your baton, you Peter? Did you did you bring the? <laughs> no, I was just <laughs> telling him to tell me when to shut up because we could <laughs> speak for another few hours on this, couldn't <laughs> yes, we? Yes, we could. I to stand up. I'll, I'll Peter, stand. If you don't mind, I think, uh, is this give us some working? Closing yeah, remarks and oh, inspiration. Right. Thank, thank you. What a great panel. <laughs> really, really enjoyed listening to you all and learning from you. Uh, but first I want to say, Sandra, thanks for reminding us about the SDGs. You know, they're not as prominent uh, in Davos as they used to be, and uh, th that's wrong. Because in 2015, humanity came together and we agreed on a plan, basically, to save our species on this planet, because you know, we're heading towards a three degrees world. That's an unlivable world for our grandchildren. And so we have to change. So the SDGs, and the Paris Agreement, our humanity's plan for survival, to put it bluntly. So uh, you know, just because we're falling behind on the Paris Agreement and we're falling behind on the SDGs, doesn't mean we start talking about fancy new things. That is our plan for survival. We've got to stick to it. If we're slipping behind, when the going gets tough, the, 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 the tough get going. Come on, let's uh, remember about these SDGs. And in my case, SDG 14. Now, why is that one so important? Well. That's the ocean uh, SDG, to conserve and sustainably use the ocean. Um, look, the ocean is in trouble, uh, and you know the mantra, no healthy planet without a healthy ocean, and uh, the ocean's health is currently measurably in decline, and I won't go through the measurements, but uh, you know, all know what they are. So uh, the BB&J fits into this very importantly because it's probably the most important thing we've done since UNCLOS in terms of trying to get it right out there in the ocean. And we're getting it wrong at present. We're using it as a garbage dump. That's continuing. That's where all the plastic ends up. And you know, as you know, the plastic's being eaten. It's microformed by uh, uh, microbial life. And microbial life happens to be 90% of the biomass of the ocean. And of course, that microbial life is eaten by bigger fish. And the fish come back to us on our plates. And it's what's causing all our endocrine disruption and all the other ills that you're hearing about. And don't think those are exaggerations. That's actually happening now. And it's why we have to clean up the whole plastic. Uh, area and we've got this plastic pollution treaty coming. Hopefully, that'll help us do that. But uh, you know, BB and J addresses the other side of things, which is that uh, you know we're just not governing this vast area out there, uh, which affects our health so much. Uh, and so uh, you know, we've got to support it. We've got to make BB and J come into force as quickly as possible. And um, you, you heard, uh, thank you, Don Andre, for uh, giving that full explanation of what BB&J brings from a developing country point of view. Yeah, the technology transfer, but also remember the uh, genetic marine resources, that uh, this is all about equity, sharing and the benefits there. Alfredo's telling me to wind up. OK, I will. Uh, what I'll wind up with and leave you all on in this regard is that we need to bring all this stuff together. You know, We can't just leave 30 by 30 global biodiversity framework out there and BB&J out here. Got to bring it all together. RFMOs, as Monica knows, are essential to this. They exist, and, uh, and some of them are performing extremely well. And uh, Andrew was referring to what's going on in the Pacific. Well, the, the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission is essential to that. We want to get the, the donut holes which exist between all the Pacific EEZs, we want to get them filled as marine protected areas. And uh, this thanks to Bezos Earth Fund 
and others is going to be a reality, I hope. But the test is, you know, how do we get the RFMOs and BB&J working together? I'm organising a Honiara summit, Solomon Islands, with the Solomon Islands government, FAO, EU, to address exactly that. We want every RFMO in the world to be there with us. We don't want BB&J implementation of these, these giant marine protected areas to take decades the way the treaty itself took. Right? We have to get this done quickly. So uh, that meeting in Honiara will be addressing that specific. And if I can leave you with one uh, take-home thought. Uh, I've been banging on for decades now about the sustainable blue economy. Don't talk about the blue economy. That's just another round of rape and pillage of natural resources. Right? But I came to realize uh, during an event here uh, that it's actually better to talk about the nature-positive blue economy. And what people like Stenner are doing are already thinking well ahead in that regard. So the nature-positive blue economy is what we should all be fighting for. And uh, there are enough people for that good guy's box that you guys are already in here in this room. Uh, just finally, I have to say these WEF meetings are so uh, useful. And I've suggested that next year that WEF put together a group, because we had one yesterday of the ports people, but it should be the ports and the shippers, because what comes first, chicken or egg and all this thing? We don't, you don't have a choice about moving away from fossil fuels in the ports and uh, in, in everything. We agreed in Dubai that we will transition away from fossil fuels. Everybody's agreed to do that. So ports and, and shipping is obviously part of that. So folks, uh, take home. Nature, positive blue economy, and BB&J will be a very important part of that. Thank you. Peter.